First, my background. I'm a professional musician, uh, first, which is only important because when you decide to be a musician, it's really the entrepreneur mindset. I find later that um, sometimes in interviews, people will say things like, how did you get the courage to quit your job? I'm like, I never had a job. <laughs> uh, it's, it, that was never part of my mindset. If you decide that you're going to be a musician, it means you know that you will never have a paycheck, you'll never have health insurance. I still don't have health insurance. You'll never have a salary, you'll never have pension, you'll never have security. It means that every dollar you make is by your own hands. So I was making a living for 15 years as a musician, and I built a website to sell my CD, which back in 1997 was kind of a big deal because PayPal didn't exist, Amazon was just a bookstore, and if you were a musician, there was literally nowhere to sell your CD. There was not a single business in the world that would sell your music. So I thought, ah, oh, fuck, I'll just build my own shopping cart. How hard could it be? But it was hard. It took like three months of work, and it was $1,000 to get a credit card merchant account, and they had to send an inspector out to my location to make sure I was a valid business, and I had to incorporate it, set up a separate bank account, and after doing all that work, I had a buy now button on my website. It was a big deal. <laughs> and so my musician friends said, like, dude, could you sell my CD through your site? I said, yeah, I guess. So that was the beginning of my little accidental business where uh, I said yes to two or three friends and then they told their friends and pretty soon I was getting calls like, hey man, uh, my friend Dave said you could sell my CD. I'm like, yeah, no problem. So I was just doing this as a favor to friends. My real living was as a musician. Uh, so as a free, free favor to friends, I set up people on my band's website. It was just 20 musicians. And then I realized I had accidentally started a business. It grew, uh, so even two years later, it was just me and one guy, the guy that was painting my house. I asked him to help me out part-time. Later, he became the vice president. Uh, <laughs> and there were 2,000 musicians. And look at this date. This is five years into it now. This is when it really started getting going. And the reason I mention this is because I meet a lot of young entrepreneurs who say, Derek, man, I don't know, things aren't going really well. Um, I'm having a really hard time with my business. It's just not getting going. And I say, well, how long have you been doing it? They're like, it's been like two months, man. It's like three months. I'm like, okay, things take a while. So it's like this little thing I started. It took four years to really get going. But then it got huge, 85 employees, 200,000 musicians, 2 million customers. And for me, this was too big. It, I didn't like it. It felt icky. I had too much responsibility. And, you know, we're at a digital nomad conference. You know what you think about responsibility. So, uh, that's when I decided for personal reasons that I just, I felt done. It felt like I had put the final brush stroke on my painting. I had nothing more to say. I was done. And so, with lovely timing before the economic crash, I sold the company. But, um, somewhere around here, I had to get kind of philosophical. Like, oh shit, 22 million. I had no idea that this thing I made was worth that. And I had to get philosophical about what I wanted to do with it. So I thought about it, it's like, I am never gonna spend $22 million in my life. I'm just not that much of a playboy. So uh, I was talking with my accountant about it and I told him about this. I said, I feel weird about this. And he said, you know, if you're really not going to spend it, there is something you can do where you can give it away in advance. Like you actually give away the company into a charitable trust before you sell it. Therefore, the purchasing company buys it from the charitable trust and you are not taxed on the money. It goes all to charity instead of coming to you first and going to charity after. So that's what I did, I gave it all away. So why are you listening to me? Um, I don't know. After watching that video, I feel like a real loser. Uh, <laughs> um, I did one push-up backstage. I was like, okay, I gotta just... So, I'm really not that good at business. I feel like my life has been a little bit like Forrest Gump, like just at the right moments I said, okay, and ended up in these <laughs> situations. But I did learn some stuff along the way, so here it is. The most important thing I've learned is knowing why you're doing what you're doing. And this is more important than everything else, and hardly anybody talks about this. We often talk about what and how to make money and this, that, but, but the why changes everything. I feel that most people don't know what they're doing. They just go with the flow, they imitate others, especially in this community. I think when we're uh, very spread out across the world, we read books like The 4-Hour Workweek, and you read this and you go like, I, I, I guess I should be going to Argentina and learning to tango, I guess, you know? It's, <laughs> but it's, it's hard to admit to yourself 
that that's not for you. Social norms are really powerful, and when other people in your community are doing something, it's hard to not feel that you should be doing that thing. So, oops. Um, the problem is, if you don't think about this stuff first, and if you just kind of go with the flow and go with things that come your way, you end up with this deathbed regret that at the end of your life you're feeling like, I did this stuff, but it all didn't feel right and felt icky, and it's because it's really hard to admit what you actually want. It's hard to admit, maybe, that you don't like conferences. It's hard to admit that you don't like drinking, or you don't like noisy bars, or that you don't like beaches. You know, we have all those pictures of hammocks. What if you don't like beaches? You like to live in the forest. Uh, it's kind of hard to admit these things sometimes when everybody else is doing it. So if you just kind of keep following everybody else, you're left with this icky feeling of like that you didn't do what you really wanted. So it really helps to put aside some time and know in advance. Maybe what you really like and what really makes you happy is making lots of money. And that's hard to admit when people are like trying to be cool, you know, like money's not cool. And maybe, but what maybe you want is prestige, maybe you want fame. So if you know in advance, then you can optimize what you're doing for this, which means letting go of the other things. So for example, um, money. I'd lived in Los Angeles for seven years, and I was friends with some kind of famous Hollywood actors. And what was really surprising is finding out that they're not as rich as you think they are, because they've optimized their life for fame. And when you optimize your life for fame, that means other people get the money. So the richest people in Los Angeles are the ones you've never heard of, the big giant mansion on the hills. They're the producers that stay very quietly behind the scenes because they know that if they let everybody else take the spotlight, they can get a bigger cut. Uh, so a similar example is uh, Donald Trump. I lived in New York City for seven years, and you just see Trump everywhere. Trump Tower, Trump Plaza, Trump this. One time I even drove two hours upstate into the countryside of rural upstate New York, and suddenly there was like, a Trump park. I was like, really, dude? Come on. But that's when I realized he's optimized his career for leaving a legacy, because he could actually make more money if he let Panasonic put their name on that building. But instead, he said, no, I'm gonna, I want it to be named after me. So he's actually not optimized his career to make the most money. He's optimized to leave the most legacy. Same thing, as you guys know, about freedom, that when you optimize your life for freedom, it does mean that you're probably going to make less money. And this is the other point, is that no matter what you choose, people are always going to tell you that you're wrong. There's always going to be somebody saying like, you know, you could be making a lot more money if you just something, something, and you did this stuff, but you listen to what they're saying, and you say, well, you're right, I would make more money that way, but then I'd have more responsibility, and I'd have to stay in one place. If you like the nomadic lifestyle, then you just decide, I'm okay with that, I'll make less money, get more freedom. If you're optimizing, there are going to be side effects. Like, you can optimize your life for making money, and you could get kind of famous in the meantime. Or you could optimize your life for freedom, and you might also leave a legacy, but it really helps to know that when it comes down to it, what is your most important value? because these choices are going to come up many times where you have to decide, like, what is the thing that has actually made you the happiest in the past, and what are you going to optimize for? So, okay, changing points. <laughs> that usually, I, I, my slides, it looks like they got a little uh, defontized or something. Usually this is yellow to let me know I'm changing the subject, so I'm changing the subject. Nobody knows the future. Uh, your business plan is moot. What this means is that I've met a lot of people who come to me with ideas and they say, I've got this idea for a business, what do you think? And I always feel like it doesn't matter what I think because as soon as you put this out into the real world, it's going to change. So my little example of this is that when I first started my little company, all it was meant to be was a credit card processing company because I had you know, done this thousand dollars of uh, credit card merchant fees and set up and I'd done the work, so at first I thought I was just going to process credit cards for my friends. That's all they asked me to do, because there was no PayPal at the time. So I was like, I will, I will charge credit cards for you and ship out the CDs to people who buy them. But then, just like two weeks after I started this, a guy from the Netherlands bought uh, somebody's CD from me, and then he came back uh, a week later, and he emailed me and he said, oh, I like that CD, where are your new arrivals? And I said, what do you mean, new arrivals? Like, who, which one of my friends am I now processing credit cards for? And he said, oh, I, I thought you were a store. I was like, a store? 
whoa, that's a good idea. I could be a store. Yeah. And so like two weeks into my business, everything changed. It's like, I'm a store. And for the next like six years, I was a great online record store. Just, you know, big warehouse and people would ship their CDs and would ship them out. It was a store. And then in 2004, do you remember when the iTunes Music Store first launched? It's like they had music. And it was a big deal. And they launched, and about a week later, I got an email from Apple saying, um, we'd like you to come into our offices for a private meeting. And I went to one infinite loop in Cupertino and went into a little room about like a third of this size, and there was Steve Jobs in full presentation mode. I was like, whoa, rock star. So uh, he was in full presentation mode saying, we want to get every piece of music ever recorded up and selling on the iTunes music store. So you know, we, need, we need everybody's catalog up and selling in our store. And so I told you, I'm, I'm like Forrest Gump. All I had to do was go, okay. <laughs> and now I'm a distributor. I'm like, all right, I'm a digital distributor. And so, you know, the business plan completely changed. Point is, everybody here has a business idea. Whatever you think it's going to be, you just have to put yourself out into the world and see, because the world will change your plans completely. And once you realize this, it's really nice to just admit that nobody knows. Nobody knows the future. All those people that like the attention on TV for pretending they know the future, they don't know the future. Even the, whatever, chief financial officer of countries, they don't even know the future. So you don't know the future either. But once you admit that, it's really nice because then people will ask you like, hey, tell me about this business you're planning on doing. What is it? You go, well, I don't know. Um, I think it also puts you into a more humble mindset because when you stop thinking of yourself as such a know-it-all, you learn to just ask more questions, and you listen more, instead of just always preaching. This would be yellow. I would be changing the subject now. Okay, revolution. Um, so, when I first started my uh, company, it was very, very simple. Uh, the music business is very complicated, but I just felt that when I realized, you know, when the guy from Netherlands thought I was a store and I decided to be a store, I didn't know how to be a store, I didn't know what to charge. So I went down to my local record store. I was living in Woodstock, New York at the time. And there was a tiny little record store about the size of this stage. And they had a counter with a few local bands that sold their music on the counter, uh, local consignment sales. So I asked them, I said, how does it work here if I want to sell my music through you? And she said, well, you just set your selling price at whatever you want. We keep a flat $4 cut and just come by once a week and I'll pay you. I said, okay, thanks. So I went home to my new website and I wrote, you set your selling price at whatever you want. We just keep a flat $4 per CD sold and you know, we'll pay you every week. I was like, there you go. There's my business model. And so that was it. That was my whole business model for 10 years. Uh, except there was one more thing. Every time somebody sent me an album, it took like 45 minutes of work to scan the album art, digitize the clips, fix their spelling mistakes in their bio, and all that stuff. So it was about 45 minutes of work, and you can tell what I was valuing my time at those days, because I thought, 45 minutes of my time, that's worth about $25. And uh, so I bumped the price up to $35 just to give a cushion so I could make discounts, and that's it. Those two numbers, $35 to add a CD into my store and a $4 cut per CD sold, that was my entire business plan, and that's what lasted me for... I don't know, like 10 years and made $8 million or something like that. But five years into it, suddenly I started getting a lot of attention. There was a lot of media stories and NPR and uh, places did a lot of press coverage about me and they were saying it's a revolution in the music industry. Re Derek Sivers is revolutionizing the music business. But it was just the simple thing. So the lesson I learned is Sometimes when you want to start a big, important business or you think you want to do something powerful and make a big impact, you think that you have to do something like mind-blowingly revolutionary. But the truth is, even the simplest thing is only revolutionary, or on people only call it a revolution once it becomes a success. So it was really just the simplest plan that worked so well. So I think if you think that revolution needs to be mind-blowing, then you'll overlook a simple idea that can help people. Just like if you think that love needs to look like Romeo and Juliet and people on balconies and poison and knives and warring families, you might overlook a simple relationship that could grow wonderfully. And if you think that revolution needs to have war and blood, you might overlook a very simple business idea that is just doing things in an easier way than other people are doing it. And that in itself can be revolutionary. 
So just simply serving people a little better can be revolutionary if it's a success. And often at the time I found that it will just feel like uncommon sense. You'll kind of feel like, like to me in 1998, it felt like the music business is this big, giant, bloated mess and the world of distribution was awful and musicians were getting paid years later, if ever, and not making any money and they didn't know who their customers were. And it just felt like this simple thing I can build in, I built CD Baby in 10 days and it just worked, it just was simple. So it just felt like uncommon sense. Okay, I'm changing the subject again. If it's not a hit, switch. So what this means is um, I spent 12 years trying everything. I had a recording studio, a booking agency, a record label. I had a, a five-piece funk band. I had a two-piece uh, performing arts duo where I ran around inside a Lycra bag called the Professional Pests. And I did all these kind of things, and none of it was a success. Everything felt very hard, like I was always beating on locked doors, and just no opportunities were coming my way. It was always difficult. Like, I, I did make a living. I was able to, like, get a house with the money I made doing things, but it was hard. But then when I started this silly little hobby to just help my friends sell their music, it just, phew, it just took off. And it reminds me of the interviews I read with musicians who have had a hit song, that a lot of the hit songs that you hear on the radio are written by musicians that have written, like, a hundred songs that were not a hit and suddenly they write one song, often, actually many times, it's a throwaway song that they almost weren't going to put on the album because it was just so stupid. But they're like, oh, okay, let's just hit record. And they hit record, and that becomes the number one hit. And who knows why? You know, who let the dogs out? You know. So <laughs> nobody knows why that's a hit song. But the, the point is that when, you, when it happens to you, you can feel the difference. You go, okay, now I get it. All those other things I tried, all those you know, locked doors, they just weren't clicking with people. And suddenly, once you have something that people like, you feel it. It just feels completely different. So my advice, having felt the difference between ideas that uh, click and don't click, is that if people aren't loving what you're doing, you just stop. Don't try to... Uh, beat them down with an idea that just isn't resonating people. Don't persist, don't push it. But this goes against the advice that you often hear, that persistence means success, right? So the point is that when you've got something great, you'll know because people will be really freaking out. Like if you have a business idea and you tell your friends and they say, yeah, cool, that sounds really cool, man. Let me know when you do that. That's not good enough. That was kind of a nice way of them saying no. Because you'll know when, when you have an idea that people love, they'll say, holy shit, are you serious? Can I pay you right now? I want to be your first customer. Can I pay the test? I need this now. And when people say this and they like, are actually giving you money, then you'll know you're onto something. Anything less than that, I think just let it go, do something else. I, I said write a different song because in the music business for 10 years, I met a lot of songwriters that like, they wrote one song about their wife or something, and they just go around the music business for 10 years trying to get somebody to record this song. And it's like, whereas the successful songwriters, they just keep writing. They write 100 songs, and then one of them becomes a hit. So if you have a business idea and people aren't freaking out over it and trying to give you money, just let it go. Come up with another one. Write another song. <laughs> so you have to redefine persistence. That persistence is not just doing the same fucking thing over and over again and hoping it works. Success comes from persistently kind of changing and trying different approaches. It's the same goal, but different approaches. Not persistently pushing what's not working. So, changing the subject again. Version 0.1. You guys know software version numbers, right? Like version 1.0. Um, there is there was a guy I met at a music conference that I was just talking with people and I said, so what do you do? And he said, I'm making the ultimate music recommendation engine. It is going to be the biggest thing. It's going to tie together with all your social profiles. It's going to do every song that you like and every song that your friends like. It's going to build the ultimate something on your music recommendation service. And I said, okay, um, so how's it going? He said, oh, well, I haven't you know, it, it doesn't exist yet. I'm trying to find financing. For the last two years, I've been trying to raise money because I figured this thing is going to take $2 million to make. So do you know any investors? I was like, okay, dude, how about this? What kind of music would I like? And he said, what? I said, what kind of music would I like? You said you're building a music recommendation service, so what kind of music would I like? He said, nah, Dan, dude, come on. It, this, I'm talking, this is big. This is enterprise, man. This is going to be the biggest thing ever. 
I was like, well, okay, you're missing the point. Well, actually, sorry, let me back up. I was just to be kind of an asshole because I was getting annoyed at this guy. I turned to somebody next to me. I was like, I saw my friend Mark over there. I was like, Mark, I've got a question. What kind of music do you like? And he said, oh, I like Bjork. I said, have you heard Leaky Lee yet? And he said, no. I said, check it out. Let me know what you think. I said, I just started a recommendation service. <laughs> it's not that hard. So this guy's just like going around trying to raise money, and he's not actually doing it. So this is what I call version 0.1. Sorry, actually, I'm still not ready to talk about CD Baby yet. Version 0.1 is the thing in software version numbers. I feel that when a lot of people describe their business idea, in software version numbers, what they're describing is like version infinity. It's like this is what it will be in the glorious future. If everything works out right, this is what it will be someday. But you have to like go back to like not even version 1.0, you have to go to like version 0.1, which is the thing that you can start like this week. And you can do right now, like me asking my friend Mark, you know, because if I was really serious about be building a music recommendation service, I just asked Mark what he likes, Leaky Lee, I write it on a piece of paper. And then like a week later, I call him and I say, hey, Mark, did you hear Leaky Lee yet? Did you like it? No. I said, okay. Now I know. And then slowly you could build that into a spreadsheet, you put it into a website, and you're actually building something, right? Instead of just trying to raise money. So, my version of CD Baby 0.1 was when I had this idea to make this thing for my friends, it literally took like 10 days to build, and I didn't even know what I was doing. I had no programming experience, but I just copied a CGI bin Perl script out of a book. And all it did is it would show you my friends' CDs, and you would click buy, and it would bring you to one of those forms with your name and address and your credit card. And I'm a little embarrassed to admit this. It was you know, a big no-no to do this. But all it would do is just email me their credit card. And that's it. That's all the website did. And then at home, because I only was getting like one order a week, so I would just highlight my mouse over the credit card, like Control-C, Alt-Tab, Control-V, highlight, Alt-Tab, highlight my mouse over their name, Control-C, Alt-Tab, Control-V. And that's all it took. So while other people were out there trying to raise money, I had started. And that's why I think CD Baby became successful, is because when I started it, I had no competitors. And it's like, if you were a musician that wanted to sell your music online, there was a guy named Derek in New York that would do it for you, and that's it. There were no competitors. There was nowhere else in the world to sell your music online. A year later there were, because all those people that had spent too long developing their thing launched too late. I had already been doing it for a year. So, oh, wait. Oh, and yeah, it only, because of this, it only took six weeks to be profitable. So if you're not, there's a great quote, I think, from Reid Hoffman, I think, who started LinkedIn, that he said, if, if you're not embarrassed by your first launch, you've launched too late. So launch before it's ready. Okay. Ideas versus execution. I'm changing the subject again. Um, I once, unfortunately, got introduced to a guy. You know those awkward situations where you have a mutual friend that wants to introduce you to somebody? and they do it by CC on the email, and so now you have to say yes, even if you don't really want to meet the guy. I'm like, oh, fuck, because now I'm socially obligated to my friend. So I said, okay. He said, I've got this friend that has this billion-dollar idea. You've got to meet him. He, I, I think you really need to hear this. I'm like, fuck, okay. So the guy contacts me, and, he, and we get on the phone, and he said, okay, I've got this amazing idea, but I need you to sign this NDA first because this is a billion-dollar idea. And I usually never sign NDAs, but now I'm obligated. I'm like, fuck, okay. I fax it to him. There. There's your NDA. What's this fucking billion-dollar idea? And he said, okay, are you ready? Okay. Online dating with music. And I said, yeah? Dude, online dating with music. I said, okay, is there any more to this idea? Do you have any details? Have you started to work that? Hey, dude, online dating with music. <laughs> so, and he goes, I just figured that you could go build this thing. I mean, you're a programmer, right? So maybe you could build this thing, and I'm the ideas guy. You can just program this and make it happen. We'll go 50-50 on this, man. What do you think? I was like, okay, hold on. I got to tell you something about how the world works. That ideas in themselves are not worth anything. Ideas are just a multiplier of execution. So if you look at this, a, a bad idea, let's just give it a number, right? Bad idea is negative one, weak idea one, average idea, let's give it a five, good idea, great idea, let's say an amazing idea is worth 20. But it's worth nothing until you start executing. So, no execution. If you don't do anything, if you just tell me your idea, let's say that's worth one dollar. I'll treat for the Cokes that we're having right now. <laughs> but uh, if you actually do anything towards it, 
it might be worth $1,000 times the value of the idea. Average execution could be worth 10,000. Good execution be, could be worth 100,000. If you do amazing execution of your idea, it might be worth $10 million. The point is, in order to make a business, you need to multiply these two numbers together. So an amazing idea with no execution, 20 bucks. But if you have even a good idea with good execution, you could probably make a million dollars with it. So an amazing idea, great execution, 20 million. The point is, this is why I don't want to hear people's ideas. When people contact me and say, I've got this great business idea, I'm like, I don't care, it doesn't mean anything. Just tell me when you're doing something, when you've got the execution. That's the only thing that's worth anything. Okay. So lastly, I'm going to get specific and tell you some of the most successful things we did at CD Baby that I think you could use versions of in your own project, whatever it is. Oh, look at my funny font thing. Okay, so um, believe it or not, whenever I would be at conferences like this, uh, I used to go to, for 10 years, I would go to lots of music conferences, and I'd meet lots of musicians that were clients that I'd never met, and very often I would get to hear this magic thing, which only happens in person, where I get to hear one of my musician clients tell another musician who's not on CD Baby why they love it. And they'd say, dude, you're not on CD Baby? It's amazing. And the number one thing, the most popular reason that one musician would tell another musician that he had to be on CD Baby, they would say, dude, they answer the phone. You can call them. I, I was blown away that all the other stuff I did apparently didn't mean as much as the fact that I answer the phone when they call. So that was it. That was the most popular thing we ever did. Uh, people love the fact that they could reach us, whereas the competitors that came later, like even Amazon started up doing something that was directly competing against me, and I survived because we answered the phone. So the other thing that people loved is that I added two silly lines when I was in a goofy mood one day. In the, uh, the little script that does the outgoing emails, I said, well, at the moment that I'm putting together the email headers, I know the person's name, so why don't I put the person's name into the from address? That'll just surprise them. See, I made it so that the from would include the name of the person I was emailing. So it said, my name is CD Baby Lucera. And people would like, reply to this all the time going, you guys are freaky, this is weird, I just forwarded this to all my friends, you guys are nuts, I love you. And it would just make it something different with character, right? Next thing is that I told you that whenever a musician would send in their album, it would take like 45 minutes of work to get a new album set up in the store. And every now and then, a moody musician would change their mind on something a few weeks later. And they'd say, you know what, now that I'm looking at it, I think I want to use some different songs, or can I send you a different album art cover? And I'd say, okay, no problem, just, just send us a pizza. And they'd say, huh? And I'd say, well, look, if we're going to do this all over again, it's going to be like 45 minutes, we're going to feel kind of icky about that, but if you get us a pizza, we'll feel pretty good about that. And they said, ha, ha no, seriously. I was like, no, seriously, get us a pizza. Uh, and so I'd give them the number to the local pizzeria, and I'd say, look, they already know where we are. Um, just call and give them your credit card. They know what our favorite pizza is. Just call them and say, you want to get a pizza for CD Baby? And they'd laugh and say, like, okay. And, you know, this was just a goofy thing that I just decided was policy one day. But that became one of the most popular things that I would hear friends tell other friends at conferences about why they love CD Baby and why you should be on it. Um, Another one is at the end of the order, I would ask the customers, hey, where did you hear of this musician? And they would tell us. They'd say, oh, I heard you on TXP radio, and then I searched for your name, and I found you. Musicians loved getting this information, but like Amazon would never give that to them. And this meant more than all of my website design or JavaScript optimization or anything. Nobody cares about that, but they cared that they could get the customer comments at the end of the order. And lastly, um, I put in one last box asking customers, do you have any special requests? And I'd say, yes, anything. So one day, a customer said, I'm in the mood for some cinnamon gum. If you wouldn't mind, please include some. And one of the guys in my warehouse was just going out to the store at the moment anyway, and he's just like, yeah. And he put aside the order, he goes out to the store, he gets some cinnamon gum, bloop, and he put it in the box with the order. And the customer get, got it, and they were like, oh my god, you guys are fucking awesome! And he tells all of his friends about us, and he puts it on his blog, and he comes back all the time and tells all of his friends, dude, you need to go to this cdbaby.com to get your music. These guys are the best. And there was one time when a guy bought a CD that had like a, a picture, like the album art was a head with a squid on it. And so when he got to that part of the order, he said, actually, I think I would like a rubber squid. Uh, but if you don't have a rubber squid, a plastic squid would do. Thank you. And believe it or not, like a few months earlier, some guy from Korea had mailed us his CDs and he included like a sh freeze-dried, shrink-wrapped squid in his order. And, I mean, with his CDs as a present to CD Baby. And we had always, the guys in the warehouse had always kept it tacked up on the wall. 
So we received this order saying, you know, I'd like a squid. And the guys in the warehouse said, dude. <laughs> they got the squid and they're like, bloop. They put it in the box. And the guy got this in the mail. And he's like, holy shit. And he not only wrote a blog post about it, he went on to YouTube and made a whole video of it that has had, I don't know, how many thousands of views. So if, if you want to see it, if you go to my website, sivers.org slash squid, it will redirect you to the YouTube video. And... Um, I just think it's awesome because so many times I hear from people that are starting up a business and they say, how can I get traction, man? I really need to get word of mouth. I need to get people talking about this thing. And, you know, they think they need to do all this crazy SEO, but sometimes it's as simple as, you know, bloop, these little things you do. So the lesson learned is that people remember you more for these tiny little ways that you make them smile more than all of this other tech biz marketing stuff you do. So don't forget, it's the little things. Be unusual. Be remarkable. Everyone tells their friends when you do these quirky little things. It's, and at the time, it's shockingly unique, but it just feels like common sense. It doesn't need to feel like revolution. It's just what makes sense. That's it. Thanks. Email me anytime. <laughs>